Hey everybody, welcome to Empowered Journalism, a female-led platform providing a space for young women who want to get into journalism. Today our guest is the iconic Victoria Derbyshire, a BBC journalist and most recently known for her stint in the castle and I am a celebrity. We are here with Victoria Derbyshire who doesn't need an introduction but I'll hand over to Neve to get the question started. Yes, although you don't need an introduction, um, would you please be able to just introduce yourself slightly and, um, and tell us a little bit about your career? Yeah, so I've been a journalist for about 30 years. Um, I uh, went to uni, which is when I did a little bit of writing for the local paper and the local university newspaper. And then I worked for a year and then I did a postgrad in TV and radio journalism. And then I got my first job in as a reporter in commercial radio in Birmingham. And uh, then went to BBC local radio as a reporter, then um, did a bit of presenting, then went to do a breakfast show in another local radio station. Then I got headhunted to go to Five Live, worked there for 16 years, loved it. Uh, and then moved into TV properly and did a sort of TV version of my radio show for five years. Uh, we did really well despite that they cancelled the BBC cancelled it last year so since lockdown I have been uh, presenting on BBC News um, and here we are. Um, so I would like to know a little bit more about why you chose going to journalism and you are quite honest about the fact that you keep a diary. Did keeping a diary influence this decision or was it just something that you wanted to do? I think when I look back on the many years that I've written a diary, which was, I started at the age of nine and I've carried on, apart from one year I missed, I missed a year. Um, when I look back, I think I, I, there must have been something in me about wanting to document just my day or what happened or what I wore or where I went or who I fancied or whatever it was. And there was something about putting it down on paper that made me feel kind of ordered. And when I look back, I think, okay, well, that's a little bit about journalism, journalism isn't it? Writing down the facts and, you know, um, I think I don't, I don't feel like I chose journalism. I didn't know what I wanted to do. When I got to uni, as I said, I started to do a bit for the university newspaper, just, you know, um, film reviews. I went to interview a couple of actors at the Everman Theatre, book reviews, stuff like that. Nothing heavy, nothing that I would necessarily describe now as journalism. And I thought, you know what, I'm not, I'm not I don't really, the writing's okay, but I don't really enjoy it. So what else could I do? So then I um, got in touch with Toxteth Community Radio Station, which is basically two guys in their back bedroom running a pirate radio station. And I said, can I do some news for you? And they said, yeah, all right, if you want. I mean, they didn't really need news. It's a pirate radio station, but they were really welcoming. And so I used to go having cribbed stories out of the newspapers and just read it out in bulletins. I mean, it was just, it did not fit on their radio station at all, but it gave me a bit of uh, work experience, I suppose. Um, and that's what, and that's where I got the bug, I think. And then I thought, okay, how do I get into this? I had no idea. Um, and that's when I realised that you could do broadcast journalism, postgrads, and so kind of went from there. Now, something I've noticed about you, and um, before tonight, I did go back and try and watch all of the I'm a Celeb episodes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Dedication. Um, I, I love a bit of research, um, but you come across as someone who is such a doer and you're not afraid to get stuck in, uh, but you're also quite hard on yourself at times, I think, um, which I guess is a bit of imposter syndrome. When I've interviewed people before, I always come away and I'm like, wish I'd asked that, or I wish I'd done that differently, or I could have done that another way. Um, have you ever struggled with imposter syndrome and how have you dealt with it and how do you kind of put that to rest rather than like dwelling on it? Yeah. So I think when I first joined Radio 5 Live, so it was a national radio station, I'd moved from local radio in Manchester, physically moved to London and then joined a network radio station. I thought, oh my God, I'm really scared. I'm a northerner. 
I think I'm going to probably have to be posh for a bit because, you know, it's London and it's the BBC. And so maybe for about three or four months, I was not myself on the radio. I was trying to be a bit posh and it doesn't work because when you're a journalist or a presenter, you've got to be yourself and you've got to be true to yourself. So once I relaxed, I thought, oh God, it doesn't matter what I speak like, you know, actually what, it, what it's not what you sound like necessarily, it's, it's the content, it's what comes out of your mouth. So I think, I thought then I don't really fit in because I'm a northerner. I mean, this is 1998, it was years and years ago. I don't think I feel like that now. And, I, but I thought, but I'm doing all my work, I'm doing loads of research, I'm doing reading all my briefs, I'm doing extra work, I'm watching every news program there is reading the papers so I knew I was doing the background work and once I realized actually it's about that kind of preparation and you can be yourself then I think I relaxed and that's when I kind of sounded like me which is on the radio or the tv actually you want people to be authentic you don't want them to pretend to be someone else um so that's probably that's probably the main time when I sort of felt a bit impostery. I think when I moved from radio to TV, obviously I was much older, much more experienced. For years, people, I, I feel like people had said to me, oh, well, this, you know, we do it differently in TV. And TV was this sort of mythical, mystical, magical world that no one can get into because it's really different. And actually it's not that different. Obviously there's some technical things that are different, but the skills, of being a journalist are the same. You know, you need to do your work, do your prep, do your research. You need to listen really carefully, ask good questions. And, you know, if you're interviewing somebody who's not used to being on the media, you need to be pretty kind. Definitely. And I think sometimes, like you said, I always say that journalism and the industry is slightly shiny because it's this thing that, like when I was younger, of course I was like oh I've always wanted to be a blue peter presenter when I was younger I was yeah. like I'm never going to do that that'll never be me so you know definitely um what in the industry motivates you what gets Victoria Derbyshire out of bed in the morning and keeps you going when things are a little bit tough and you know I think many of us on this zoom right now have faced many knockbacks whether that's pitches not getting accepted or job rejections, anything like that, what motivates you and what gets you out of bed in the morning? Okay, so what gets me out of bed is, is the unpredictability of news and the variety of news. What motivates me is I care, I'm sorry if this sounds cheesy, but I mean it, I really care about people and I care about people's lives. And that's the kind of journalism I wanna do. Now, that means that, you know, I do politics, and I mean politics that affects people's lives. I don't mean the Westminster bubble. I mean, you know, a government's policies impact on people every single day. And I want to know how those people are affected by those policies. I care about injustice. I care about people who, who you don't get to see or hear much of on, on TV news. I care about giving a voice to the voiceless. I care about making people feel that the BBC is for them, even though they might think it's not um I care about normal people I think that kind of care for people definitely comes across in your work so I, like, I've watched your panorama documentary and I want to kind of talk to you about that started in April when you went on the news with the no number for the domestic abuse hotline on your hand mm -hmm. how did it feel before you went live knowing that you had that written on your hand did you expect to get the response that you got from it uh I think my answer to this will be really disappointing so what happened was in the morning there was there's a story that uh calls to the domestic abuse helpline had shot up by um I can't remember what the exact percentage was but a dramatic rise uh and so I tweeted the story in the morning and as we know, anything with a visual gets more shares. So I wrote the number on my hand and put the photo on with it. And that was that. And then when I was getting ready to, to go on air, uh, I in my head, I thought, oh, yeah, oh, I need to wash that off. And then I thought, actually, I don't need to wash that off. I'm going to keep it on. 
I had no idea if it would help anyone or do anything. I had absolutely no idea. And actually, as soon as I was on air, I completely forgot about it because you're busy and you're interviewing and et cetera, et cetera. And it was only when I came off air two hours later that I saw that someone had tweeted it and it shared it in loads of times. And, and I just, you know, I, I thought, God, it's such a small thing. And back in April, you know, that was, you know, we hadn't been in lockdown for long at all, a couple of weeks. BBC News at nine o'clock in the morning was getting something like two and a half million viewers, which is mad and which is more than BBC Breakfast, GMB this morning. And that's why it had such a massive impact. And loads of people saw it. And I don't know if it helped anyone. I have no idea, but it might have done. Someone who was in a household with an abuser who perhaps, you know, didn't have access to the internet, might see that number, might make a note of it, who knows, and might call it and get help. Definitely, and I'm sure it did help some people. I like that you just kind of left it there and forgot about it. Yeah. yeah. And so going on from that in August, the Escape from My Abuser panorama came out. And if anyone who's called hasn't seen it, go watch it. It is incredibly moving. And I just want to know, what was the process of getting that to come about? Did you have to like pitch it to anyone? Or did that come from the natural conversation that came following the response from having the number on your hand? No. So had my programme still been on air, I know that from lockdown onwards, we would have been investigating the effect of lockdown on domestic abuse. The, the, the BBC news slot that I do now, there wasn't really the space or the time or the resources actually to really get under the skin of it. So on, we got to Easter Sunday and I just emailed the editor of Panorama. I said, we've got to do this. No one's doing it. We need to look at it properly. So then you have to put a pitch in. So two women who worked on my program, brilliant women, Joe Adner and Emma Ailes, came on board with me. And so then what we're, what we're all doing then is, is effectively finding people that we think we might be able to interview or getting access to refuges. So I found some of the women um, and Emma did some brilliant work with Women's Aid who got some data on trying to do surveys of, of people who live in uh, violent households to see how lockdown had affected them. Joe did that as well. And then we had to put it all together in document, you know, loads of strat. I mean, we, it's a proper pitch. It's a proper document. And then on Zoom, we had to pitch it to the editor. We'd only finished the pitch that morning. It was a Friday morning and we sent it to her and said, you know, here it is. Please read it before we have the Zoom. We get on the Zoom. We start talking through it. The editor, Rachel, hadn't had time to look at it at all because she's just so busy. I get it. It's a seven day a week, that job editor of Panorama, um, and literally within about 10 minutes, she said, yeah, well, we're going to do this. We're definitely going to do this. It's too important. So we got off the Zoom and we were like, you know, really pleased. Uh, and then the work begins. You know, you go back to the, you contact the refugees and say, okay, they've said yes. When can we come? And obviously it's all under lockdown. It's all, so there's, you know, masks and distancing and you can't touch people and, you know, all the rest of it. Although I confess, we went to a, brilliant refuge run by a charity called Kamai in Wales and interviewed a particular woman who had escaped during lockdown honestly one of the most courageous women I have ever met and um, I talked to her about what had happened to her some awful awful experiences and she still managed to get out and we probably spoke for about an hour and there were tears and we stopped so she could have a fag break and and we got to the end and she had poured her heart out to me and we got to the end and I stood up and I said, sod COVID, give me a hug. And we just had a massive hug. And I could just feel the tension draining from her because she just said it all. And it was traumatic for her to go through it all, you know? She was incredible. And I'm so grateful to those women for A, trusting us, and B, telling us in such candid terms what their stories were. I think that definitely comes across when you watch it, how emotional it is and you can just tell these women are telling you everything yeah. logistically what was that like because a lot of them had to have their identities protected so there's a lot that went on yeah behind the scenes to keep them safe I mean, well, did you feel like a pressure to do the, the only pressure is you want to look after these people 
And if people have said they don't want their identity revealed, obviously you have an absolute duty of care to make sure that never happens. I've never, I've never inadvertently revealed anybody's identity who's asked for their anonymity. It's never happened. And I, and I feel like I've got so much experience now of how to conceal someone's identity. So you, you, you agree those parameters beforehand. Okay, do you want your identity? Do you want to be in vision or not? So this particular woman I'm thinking of said, no, I don't want to be in vision. Okay, the next question is, so do you want your voice to be used or not? Because we can get someone to voice up your words. And the woman said, well, yeah, I do want it to be my voice because you know, it's me and it's my story. And so then we have to, we have a duty to point out, okay, if it's your voice, somebody might recognize you. So let's talk about that. Let's think about who might recognize you and let's think about what the implications are. Because the most important thing is she's in a secret location at a refuge and there is no way her ex can find out where she is. Now, hearing her voice, he's unlikely to find out where she is. So then we have to say, OK, well, what if, what if a friend of yours recognises your voice and they didn't know what was going on in your household? How would you feel about that? So you have to go through all that because the most important thing is that the woman feels safe. And she wanted her voice to be used. She felt it was empowering for her to tell her story in her own words. And so, so that was the arrangement that we came to. And in that sense, when you're filming, there's lots of different ways of doing things anonymously. You know, it doesn't just have to be the cliched silhouette against a window. Uh, what we did was just real close-ups on her eyes or her hands, or um, she wore, she wore my wig. Well, I, I had breast cancer treatment. I lost my hair and I had a wig. I took my wig and she wore it and she really liked wearing it. Um, so you couldn't, so when we shot her from the back, you couldn't see her short hair. You saw my wig. So there are loads of ways of disguising her identity. Um, but yeah, all that takes time before you even get in the car to drive there, but it's absolutely worth it. Yeah, definitely. And just like my last question on the panorama is you were very open about your own experiences. What made you kind of make that decision where you're worried about being open about it and how people might respond to you or did you just want to share your part of the story as well? I wasn't worried about what people might think because I don't really mind. I knew it was relevant to that piece of journalism. It wasn't just apropos of nothing. You know, if I've been doing a panorama on, you know, um, quarantine hotels, obviously I wouldn't be talking about my own experience. It felt relevant. It felt... I felt, look, I'm asking these women to tell me about their experiences and I felt I should share mine with them. So there was that mutual trust there. Um, I checked with my family um, if they were okay with me talking about it. Um, some were happier than others. Some were much more comfortable than others, but they didn't say, I, I don't want you to do it. Um, but some are more private than others. That's fine. I totally respect that. I didn't mention anyone else in my family. I don't think. I did mention my mum. She was cool about that. Um, yeah, and it just, it felt relevant and it let the audience know that I knew what some of these women had gone through and, and, and that felt appropriate. And the reaction, by the way, I mean, God, it was overwhelming. So many people got in touch to say... Thank you for speaking out about this. Thank you for shining a light on this. And it's the whole panorama scene. It, obviously, it's not just me. It's camera people. It's the exec. It's the producer, director. It's Joe and Emma. Uh, it's the editor. Just so pleased that someone had gone in depth and shown definitively with help from Women's Aid that violence in lockdown gets worse. We were able to prove. And unsurprisingly, three quarters of those living in a violent household said it was much harder to escape. So we've proved that. And the last time Boris Johnson announced lockdown, for the first time, he mentioned domestic abuse as being a reason to be able to leave your home, which he never had before. So it was exercise, medicine, essential caring, and if you're in a domestic abusive household. So we achieved something. Yeah, you definitely did. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how you talk about how much of a trusted audience is an audience journalist have because I think the nature of the industry is that you're put on this pedestal and I think events like this definitely help to break the glass ceiling slightly I always think they do 
Um, and it's interesting because you're in a career that you love, in an industry that you love, and you've been both on the receiving end of negativity and negative messages, but actually from talking about your own personal experiences, you've had positive messages. When you started out in your career, and I mean, even now, did you ever realise just how much influence and I guess responsibility you and journalists in general have? No, absolutely no way. Um, I think, God, when I think back to when I first started, I, I, I don't know, it felt, it felt very insular. I don't know why. I think the more experience I've got, the more I've been drawn to particular types of journalism, um, I felt more of a responsibility. And only in that, you know, I have a responsibility to look after people. I have a duty of care to people. Um, quite often I make, I end up making friends with people I've interviewed, particularly particularly people who've gone through really, really tough times. Uh, I've checked that they're all right. I want to make sure they're okay. I keep in touch. I help if I can. Um, and I have a responsibility to, to be accurate, to be fair, to be courteous, to be robust when it requires, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm, I'm always going to be challenging to a politician, always. They're in, a, they're in a different category. They're used to the media. They, their job is to answer questions. They have a massive impact on our lives. Um, I, I would be, I would always be courteous to them, but I would be different to them in a way that I am with members of the public who are not used to being on TV or radio. Yeah, it's a responsibility. And sometimes you get things wrong and, you, and, and I, if I, if I get it wrong, I just say, I'm really sorry. I messed up. It's the, it's, it's so obvious. It's the only way just own those mistakes, you know? Yeah, definitely. I think accountability is really important. And we couldn't have you on here without talking about I'm a Celeb because we all <laughs> we all loved it. But every night, all of us on like our journal, like journal group chats, like, oh, let's work a bit deeper in. Oh. Honestly, you were amazing on it. And something that struck me when you were on it is that conversation you had with Jess in the bathroom when you were talking about cancer. And I told you know, after that, there was such a positive response to that and you've mentioned that you've had people in your DM saying from that they've gone to check out and they've maybe been diagnosed earlier than they would have done or got that reassurance that everything's okay. Mm -hmm. So when you were like first diagnosed with breast cancer, how did you make that decision that you wanted to be public with it and almost take people on that journey with you? So again, it was to do with journalism. I, th I mean, it was, before I made that decision, I had, weeks and weeks and weeks of anxiety. I didn't know if my cancer was treatable. So I, it, it was really, it was awful. It was a real blow. And I thought, I, I think that this is it. You know, I'm not sure I'm gonna grow older with my boys. I'm not sure I'm gonna go grow older with my partner. This is, my time is up. And it was really, really distressing. Um, once I'd gone through all the weeks of tests and biopsies and all the rest of it, and it became clear that my cancer was treatable, albeit with a mastectomy and chemo and radiotherapy, then I thought, okay, right, I'm a journalist. I want to keep working. And I, maybe if I don't really know what chemotherapy is, maybe the other people won't know. So I'll just be a journalist and just document it, which is what I did. I don't think I'd realised when I started filming that through the course of that journey, this is how naive I was in terms of treatment, through the course of that journey, of course, there would be some highs and there would be lows. And, and you, have to, you have to be honest about all of it. You can't just sort of pretend that, you know, you're so positive and so energetic that you're getting through this. You have to document the lows as well, because that is honest. And I wanna be honest and I wanna, and it's only, it was only my experience. It doesn't mean anybody else's experience would be the same. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think once I knew that I was going to live, I thought, okay, I'll do, I, I want to, uh, you know, approach this as a sort of journalism project as well, which I did. I, obviously I had no idea what the response would be. I had no idea that even now people say, I've just watched your video on YouTube when you had your mastectomy and you've taken a little bit of the fear away from me, I've got my operation next week. I mean, that is just mental. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm overwhelmed. And I'm, I'm just... Yeah, I'm humbled by it, seriously. 
Yeah, I think it is just wonderful that people get comfort with that. So someone who's breast cancer runs in my family, seeing someone be so open about it, it is refreshing that you showed the highs and lows. I think for public figure, people want the happy, yeah. positive all the time. Yeah. And life isn't that. And kind of going, on, especially since I'm a celebrity, your platform has just boost like crazily. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. How do you draw that line with sharing your experiences and bits of your life to keeping things private? Um, I find that quite easy. I mean, if it's if it's relevant to journalism and it's my experience, then I I will consider being open about it. Um, I don't post stuff about my kids, really, although both my sons took over my social media when I was in the castle, which I was so, I didn't know how it was going to work out. They did a bloody amazing job. I could not believe it. My oldest son did my Twitter. Joe, my younger son, did my Instagram honest, and TikTok. They were amazing. And they loved it. They felt so part of it. It was brilliant. But I wouldn't post, I don't post pictures of them. I don't say what my son got in his GCSEs. I don't really talk much about my husband. Uh, I do talk about my dogs. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I think it's quite, for me, it feels a fairly straightforward line down the middle. Yeah, that's great. I think let's do one more of our questions and then we'll move on to the Q&A section. Um, I mean, I... I'm loving your Dear Victorias on Instagram. I particularly loved your most recent one. As someone who hasn't gone to university, so I can fully, I felt what that person who messaged you felt and the idea of kind of, can, is this possible? Can you do it? Um, I mean, you've done so many different things in your career as well. And, you know, I mentioned the agony on kind of stuff now, but for people entering the industry, right now do you think it's about having a set direction and saying yeah I'm going to be a political journalist and I'm going to work at the BBC or is it more about being able to say I want to try loads of different things and I want to dabble in things and just and do a variety rather than saying this is what I'm doing can you do both is that allowed is that can my answer <laughs> can you do both yeah yeah so I mean you might you you know you watching this, you, some of you might know, right, I really want to be the political editor of the BBC, or I really want to present my own news current affairs show on BBC radio or BBC television. There is nothing wrong with having that goal. Absolutely nothing wrong. I think uh, early-ish on, I knew that I wanted to present a news and current affairs show on the radio. I absolutely knew that. And I was happy, I love being a reporter. It was a real adrenaline rush. Um, but I knew that ultimately that's where I wanted to go. That doesn't mean you can't dabble in loads of different things on the way. Uh, and I just, I do feel, you know, if you've got a goal, you've got to go for it because life is short. You know, I know that from my cancer diagnosis, life is short. You, you are all so young. You've got loads of years to absolutely go for it and go for it. You must. Um, in the uh, agony and, post that you're referring to Neve on Saturday mm-hmm. I shared a little story about uh, a program that I loved when I was growing up called The Clothes Show none of you will remember it you're all way too young honestly it was fantastic they should bring it back to be honest it was a Sunday afternoon you could bring it back I could I'm not really an expert in clothes and <laughs> stuff but, uh, but yeah actually I could that's a great show Neve um, and it I'll was co-host and work with you on yeah. it yeah absolutely um it was it was just half an hour every Sunday you know London uh London Fashion Week Milan Fashion Week uh High Street you know what's the latest fashions it, you know it, I loved it anyway so I really as a sort of 15 year old I thought I really 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 want work experience on this program so probably about 17 I started I wrote to the editor and said please 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 can I have work experience on your program and obviously a million teenagers would have written to him this was pre-email, obviously, pre-mobile phone, pre-Instagram, pre-everything. So I literally hand-wrote a letter to Mr. Castle. Anyway, he didn't reply. So I wrote again the next month, and then I wrote the month after that, and the month after that, and the month after that. And I did a letter every month for two years. <laughs> and I thought, okay, so he's just got used to my letters now. I've not had a response. I'm going to write to him in French because at least that might attract his attention again. So I've got my friend, my sister's friend to help me 
who's half French to write it in French. Then I got a phone call. Uh, he said, hello, is that Victoria Darkshire? And I said, yeah, speaking. He said, hi, this is Roger Castles, editor of The Clothes Show. I nearly dropped the phone, a landline, obviously, in those days. And he said, I feel like I know you because of all the letters that you've written to me. He said, would you like to come down for a week's work experience uh, during London Fashion Week? And you can see what it's like to work on the clothes show. And I was like, oh my God, yes, please, yes. <laughs> so that took me two years. It was, I had the best week. He really looked after me. And it meant that I could, I ended up applying for a job as a researcher on the clothes show, which I didn't get because I was actually overqualified as it turned out, but it didn't matter. The point was I persisted, I persisted. I didn't give up. I probably bored into tears with blood, with blood letters, but it worked. Yeah. So don't give up. Yeah, that's really good advice. And we're going to jump into the Q&A now. Cool. First one, which is, I'm, this is from Lauren. And I'm picking this one because as a proud northerner, I feel like this is something important to talk about. So do you think that there's still a stigma when it comes to northern accents and television? And if so, what steps do you think have been taken to combat this? So I don't think there's a stigma about northern accents. I, I mean, I could name you, are we just talking about TV, on TV? Are you talking about TV generally or TV news? TV news. Right, okay. Okay, quite a lot of people on TV news are posh. Uh, and, and that's probably inverse snobbery. So there probably aren't enough accents on TV news. I think that is changing. I mean, I'm a northerner, I do the TV news. I, I say, I don't say bath, I say bath. Um, I, I, I honestly don't think audiences give a toss anymore. Really, what you sound like. I, I, I might be wrong. I'd love to know what everybody else thinks on that. I, I just don't think there's a stigma. I think things have changed so much. I mean, I might be wrong. I might, you know, if I were, was able to invite three bosses in now and I said, would you not employ someone on the TV news because they had a strong Geordie accent? I just can't, I mean, maybe privately they might think, no, I wouldn't, but publicly they'd have to say, of course we would, of course we'd employ someone because it's just, it's just so old fashioned and it's so wrong, you know? And the point is if we want to, appeal to the widest audience then we need to reflect the audience and that means diversity of color class and accent yeah definitely and as some what i will say is any time me and my mum hear someone with a northern accent on tv whether it be tv news or ever like oh it's northern yeah. accent there <laughs> makes us so happy yeah, good. <laughs> so, yeah. good yeah I mean, I wish I had an accent and could comment on that because I, <laughs> I don't feel like I have one at all. Um, I We've had so many questions. We've currently got 27 in the question box. Um, one of them, and I know this is one that we have pre-submitted, what has been the biggest pinch me moment in your career so far? In anything? Uh... I mean, I could give you a few examples, to be honest, but I'll, I'll give you a couple. <laughs> and, I, I, and you need to take this the right, right way. Okay. So I interviewed live on TV one Friday morning on daytime TV at quarter past nine in the morning for men who told me that they had been sexually abused by their football coach when they were nine, 10, 11, 12. Um, obviously I'd got to know them a little bit I'd spent a lot of time on the phone with each of them so I knew exactly what their stories were you know they told me everything and I said okay I'm going to ask you about this on TV are you okay with that are you comfortable with that they said yeah we want people to know how horrific it was and in the studio that day they were so courageous and dignified and honest and you could have heard a pin drop in that studio. And I was sitting on the sofa in the middle, two on one side, two on the other, Chris, Andy, Jason and Steve, and they just told us everything and our audience, everything. Live, four men on national TV in the morning. I mean, I just, I don't think there is another show that would have done that. Uh, 
I don't think there's another show that would have done that with such respect that created such a safe environment for them to do that. What it led to was not only, you know, massive news story everywhere, but it led to hundreds of other people coming forward and contacting the police and saying, I too was abused by that coach. And ultimately it led to that, that man being convicted and sent to jail. So that to me is journalism that, that changes things, that has a massive impact and that changes things for the better. So that was one moment which I'll never ever forget. And I suppose the other one which is related to that and I dedicated it to those four guys was then winning a BAFTA TV award for that interview. Um, and again, that was, that was a pinch me moment because you know, we'd never been to the BAFTAs before. It was amazing. Obviously, there were famous high profile people everywhere you looked and it was just the most incredible night. So, yeah. That's amazing that you've managed to start, not a movement is the wrong word, but almost start the ball rolling to get justice for these, for the horrible thing that had happened to them. And oh gosh, I've just lost my question. Isn't it strange as well how easy it is? I feel like I could sit here and tell you my whole life story and you would just listen. And I feel like that's such an odd thing. Like, there's no other professions where you'd easily just be able to sit there and be like, I'm neither, this is what I do, and this is what goes on in my life. And it's I find it really crazy. Yeah. And I would I would be absolutely fascinated to hear your life story, Neve, or yours or, or anyone. Honestly, like I really I'm genuinely I'm really interested in people and they'll I just want to know stuff, you know, and I would be even if I wasn't a journalist, I would be like that, you know. Yeah, and that really came across on I'm a Celebrity. Any time you would go sit with someone, we were, I remember we were sat in the room with my mum and my dad. I'm like, ooh. I wonder what's going to happen here. Were you aware of how much you did that before you watched I Was Celebrity? And literally every time you sat down, an amazing story came out. No, I, I, I ask questions. That's why <laughs> yeah. in my private life, in my professional life, it's just it's just the norm for me. You know, I'm I am curious about people and their background and their mums and dads and what motivates them and how they fell in love and who their first kiss was and, you know, all that sort of stuff, you know. Yeah, it's amazing. And this is I have a question now because you've come across as so confident and this is one of our pre-submitted questions. Someone's asked, what advice would you give to your younger self, the budding journalist and a woman entering the world of journalism? Uh, I would say... think about this it's such a good question I feel and, and I'm really happy to be corrected on this but I feel that now the fact that you're a woman should be almost irrelevant you know we have made such progress in all sorts of areas in terms of getting into management getting to senior level being trusted journalists equal pay that doesn't mean the battle is won it really doesn't but I just feel so much progress has been made. And so I would say, always ask. If you want an opportunity, ask. Because the worst that can happen is someone says no. That's something I've always done. I've always said, well, could I do that? Or can I go on that trip? Can I present that? Can I um, have the same salary as my male co-presenter? Doesn't always work, but you've just got to ask. And those conversations can be so difficult when you think, when you're building up to them, but. You've just got to do it. And actually, in most cases, your boss will respect you for asking, even if the answer's no. And obviously, you ask politely and courteously and firmly. Um, I think we're really good now at calling out any crap, any sexist stuff, any abuse, any hate. I think we're really good at that. I also feel, in a way that I didn't necessarily feel when I started out, I think there's such a good support when it comes from women colleagues. You know, there's quite a lot of solidarity between women in the industry, which I love. Um, and, you know, you, you, people of my age, I'm 52 now, I want to help you get into your chosen areas and I'll do what I can do because 
because why not? The more of us, the better. I would just say you have to, you know, you just, I know you get nervous and I know you can think, oh, I can't possibly say that in that meeting because there's all those men and they're all bluffing away. You've just got to speak up. You've got to do it. Because if not you, then who, you know? Definitely. Um, I just, we've, we've had this before said on workshops about how much there are so many senior people who want to help people like us who want to get into the industry. Um, I, we had this pre-submitted and we've actually had it on the, on the Q and A <laughs> button quite a bit, the Q and A. Um, how do you, as a journalist, I'm not going to ask how you switch off because majority of times, and I can sit here and say, you don't. Um, but from a mental health point of view, I feel like it's not talked about enough in the industry. And, you know, you've covered some incredible stories that, mental health is involved and you know they can be really draining stories and very difficult how do you kind of is it is the word compartmentalize that side of things and protect your own mental health it's quite hard i have to say it's quite hard um i feel often i'm drawn i'm drawn in to the stories that i cover and i don't think that's a bad thing um no, I can be impartial, but I don't have to be dispassionate. I'm still a human being. I still feel it when I put myself in someone's shoes who's been through something. There was a year of um, the Manchester terror attack, which I covered. I got sent up there in the morning. Then there was the Grenfell fire. There was another one. I think it was maybe the Westminster Bridge attack. There were a number of awful events that I covered live which I wanted to do. I wanted to be there. I wanted to, you know, tell the nation what was going on. And I think there was a, and then I had a week off, you know, whenever it was. And I woke up one morning and I felt really tearful. And I thought, this is weird. And I thought, I, I, what, what is, I didn't know what it was. I'm not, I'm not that kind of person. I don't, I don't think, oh, you know, I'm really affected by all these stories I've been covering because it's not about us. It's not about us. It's about the people who've been involved in these events. And I actually made a decision to get in touch with um, the BBC, offer a counsellor or, you know, a sort of helpline and ended up just talking to someone and saying, look, I feel really tearful. I'm crying. I don't know if it's because of these things I've been doing at work or, but, and then I feel guilty because I wasn't involved in the Manchester terror attack. I wasn't, I wasn't in that tower, you know, and I just spoke to someone for about 40 minutes. I don't know if it helped me, but I felt a bit better sort of getting it out of me. You know, I, I could have, I could have spoken to my husband about it, I'm sure, or a friend, but it felt better talking to someone who wasn't involved really, or wasn't close to me. And that helped a bit. Um, just to, it didn't compartmentalize it, but it, just speaking it, getting it out of me helped. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, it helped. But I think it is hard. And I think we really do have to take care of our mental health. And that doesn't mean we're snowflakes or we're soft or we're wet or any of those things. It just means that we're sensible in the way that we look after our physical health. We absolutely have to do the same for our mental health. Definitely. And I think not bottling things up. And I actually didn't know the BBC had that like support system in place. I think it's definitely a move in the right direction to yeah. support mental health because it is so important. That's a relatively recent um, introduction. I mean, the last few years we've had it, but it's only been in the last few years. So this is kind of a move away from that, but a bit similar one that we've had on the chat from Isabel. How did it feel going from life in the castle to real, like back to reality, back to your day job, back when you couldn't hug people outside? Oh, it was so weird, Isabel, honestly. Thank you for these amazing questions, by the way. Uh, so obviously we, it was such a privilege to be in that castle, to not have to wear masks, to not have to socially distance, to be able to hug, to be able to be normal. And remember we'd had, or maybe you didn't know, but we had two weeks quarantine before we went into the castle. So I was literally on my own in a house, in an Airbnb in Wales, um, 
my kids were at school. My husband was looking after them in London. So I was literally on my own, which actually was really nice because I never have any time on my own. But by the time two weeks was up, I was desperate for human contact. So it was perfect timing in a way. And it was just brilliant to be in that environment and to find that it was a group of people where there were no dicks. Everyone got on and had a really lovely time and became really good friends. And we still are. And we, we had a Zoom on Friday night and blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, you get out and everyone's got masks on. You've got to keep your distance. The cameraman's keeping your distance. The taxi driver, the doodle. you know, you call in a service station and you, you go to the loo on the way back home from Wales to London and people are wanting to chat to you and have selfies, which is absolutely wonderful and gorgeous. And I love to chat to anybody. But then you've got to go, oh, my God, we can't have a selfie because we well, can, but you've got to be up there enough. So it was just bizarre. And then it was actually a relief to get home where you're in your family bubble and you, your dogs and your kids and your husband and you can just be normal again. But then to meet up with my friends who were desperate to know what it had been like, who'd been watching it every night, we had to go and sit in their garden, six of us outside with a blooming heater. But that was the way it was, you know. And actually, when you look back at that now, actually, that was quite a free time because... Obviously, since, you know, just before Christmas, it all went Pete Tong again. It did. That's a good way of putting it. it really Do you know did. what? Watching I Miss Leb, the biggest moment when I was absolutely gutted for you was in the morning when they were like, we're going to the pub. Yes, we're going to treat to the pub. And you were so excited. You was one of the most vocal people. And then in the evening, it was like, I'm you're sorry. gone. And I've got to say... I was absolutely gutted. Oh my um, God, Eve, you were not as gutted as me. <laughs> I, I mean, to be fair, so I'm 52, I'm the mum of teenagers. I went into it to have a brilliant time. The idea of, you know, being the final three, none of that, I didn't care about that. It was all about the experience. However, I just, when I look back at it, if I could have had one more night, because I would have loved going to that pub and the karaoke and then, oh my God, I was gutted. But then obviously when they all came out, I was, I said, I cannot believe I missed that pub because I was so happy about, you know, a few hours before they said, yeah, we're going to the pub. I was like, you're joking. Hooray, hooray, hooray. And they said, we were there for an hour. We had one hour. That was literally it. So I felt slightly better after that. But yeah, I would have absolutely loved that. I just, one more night would have, would have seen me good. But I, you know, no regrets. I absolutely loved it. I enjoyed every single second of it. Was there any moments that happened off camera? I mean, we had the highlights show on the Saturday night. I'm, I still wish the, um, your conversation with Jess had been in the actual show, but you know, we'll get over that. Yeah. Um, but was there anything that happened kind of off cameras that you wish had or something behind the scenes, a bit of juicy gossip would be nice. So the cameras are there all the time. So the main living areas, there are camera people behind a camera camouflage. In the sleeping area, there are remote cameras and you can hear them sometimes moving position. Um, and again, in the bathroom, remote cameras. So everything is on camera and it is incredible how within 48 hours, you've totally forgotten there are cameras there. Occasionally in the living quarters, we could hear like a, can of coke being opened and it was one of the camera people um and we'd occasionally chat to them they would never respond but we'd say hi all right you're working the late shift tonight or whatever they were there 24 7 it was mad obviously doing shifts so the cameras were there all the time so if there was anything we wanted to say to each other that we definitely didn't want to want to be on tv what we would do was start the story and then we would sing uh, a famous famous song that we knew they'd never be able to put on TV because ITV would have to pay a fortune for the music rights. So, uh, you know, if I was telling the story about the BBC that I didn't want the to go out on TV, you know, you'd start singing, all you need is love. Anyway, so you'll never guess what she said to me. Da, 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 all you need. And then that's how we do it. So that was our kind of trick to, to, to get stuff in. There were points where we'd start a conversation and we'd go, I'll tell you what, we need to carry this on when we're out of here because we can't have this going out. <laughs> and there was some really, what I would describe as private, intimate conversations, which were so private, they were, ICV were never going to put them out because either they were too sad, they were too intimate. Uh, and we, we trusted ITV and I think they did a really good job that, you know, 
They want a show that's fun and a laugh that shows highs and lows, but mostly highs. So we, we knew that, you know. Yeah, I think it definitely came across as a laugh. I think, because I'm a big fan of I'm a Celebrity, and this, your series was one of the nicest bunch of people the on best. there. There were no arguments. We were waiting, like, is something going to happen? And it just never did. And it's what but we needed. People, you know what? Some people said, oh, it's boring because no, everyone's, apparently, everyone's getting on and there's no conflict. And I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I've watched some of it back. I haven't watched all of it back. It, when I watch it, it just makes me smile. It just makes me happy. But was it, was it a bit boring? Be, be absolutely honest now. No. no. Do you know what was nice about it? I think it came on at the time where there was, are we going to go back into lockdown? What's going to happen? You needed something that was just fun and that made you smile. And you don't want to see people arguing when the world around you is very crazy. Yeah, you yeah. Do, you know what, do you know what was nice? The fact that the, I always want to call it the jungle. Wasn't the jungle. Um, that all of you in the castle, it was, what was it like an hour that we got to watch a day when COVID was barely mentioned at yeah. all. Yeah. And although maybe some people would say, actually, you know, the fact that they got to be really close together and all of that when we weren't allowed to, I think the complete opposite because actually you had really interesting conversations and it wasn't, it wasn't about the drama. Yeah. It, it didn't need to be. It was about people coming together. And I mean, there were a lot of emotional moments, oh, wow. <laughs> if I'm honest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it was about yeah. I think you're right, Neve. It was about the camera. I think it was, this series was about the camaraderie, and maybe because of lockdown. Oh God, I've got some bloody update. I'm. Hang on, let me just get rid of it. Yeah. Um, maybe um, that was what the country needed because of lockdown and all. As you say, all all the crazy stuff going on in the real world. You know, it was definitely what we needed. And going on, I've just seen a question from Grace that I have to ask you. So it's a bit of a fun one. What was the most bonkers slash bizarre story you have covered in your career? Oh God, Grace. Um, bonkers slash bizarre. I used to be a mermaid once. <laughs> Obviously not a real mermaid. Um, on our show, I can't even remember what the story was. It was something like she, oh my God, she, she, she was doing some swim in her local swimming baths. <laughs> to raise money in a mermaid's outfit. So literally, I, I say, let's go live to Al Alicia, I can't remember her name, uh, who is a mermaid in Coventry. And there she is lying on, I think her kitchen yeah. top or kitchen island in a mermaid's outfit. And it was just surreal. Um, I also interviewed a guy wearing a mask because he was, he runs a, oh my God, I can't remember what it's called. He runs a kind of, it's like a mini private eye, but in Rochdale. And he doesn't want anyone to know his identity. And so I interviewed him when he was wearing a mask, which was quite fun. That was also bizarre and a bit surreal. Um, uh, in local radio, I introduced uh, a guy from the local council who was the head of the education department. And I said, you know, let's talk to councillor John Smith, who is the head of the education department. And obviously this is radio. And he looked across at me and he went like this. And I said, and he didn't say anything. So like, you've got to explain to the listeners then what's going on. I said, well, I've just introduced Councillor Smith and he's shaking his head at me. Are you not in fact Councillor Smith? And he said, and I said, it's okay, you can speak. <laughs> and he said, no, I'm not, I'm not Councillor Smith. I'm so sorry, I'm, 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 I'm here for whatever the story was, you know. And, and again, it's fine. Or I think audiences go with you. If you say, oh, I'm so sorry, it's been a total mess up. You're here to talk about X. Okay, well, let's talk about X now then, as you're here. As long as you sort of front it up and say, look, I'm sorry, I'm human. We made mistakes. I think audiences go with you, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, because we've only got three minutes left, I actually wanted to throw you a bit of a curveball. And, and do something that we've actually never done before, because you love asking questions so much. Yeah. Would you like to ask myself and Orla a question each? Okay. Oh. Um, so... Not that you know us, but... No, I don't, I don't know. So, 
Um, let me think. Okay. Orla, who is the woman in the world, anyone in the world that you would want to interview tomorrow? Can it be dead? Can it be someone who's not here anymore? Sorry, can it be dead? Does it have to be someone who's alive? Yeah, alive. Is there, is there no one alive that you want to interview, Orla? <laughs> there is. <laughs> oh my God. Um, do you know what? And this might be a bit random, but she's just come to my head. I'm gonna say Meghan Markle because hey, I- Great, that would be I, amazing. I have this thing and I remember that, and I just thought that she's pregnant, so congratulations, Meghan. But I have seen this, it was this post that was just taking headlines, some that were about Kate and some that were about Meghan and comparing how she was portrayed. And I would just love to talk to her about how she dealt with joining the royal family. Yeah. I just think, I mean, I'm a bit of a fan of hers. And so yeah, Meghan Markle is- That would be amazing. I would love to interview her. Okay, right, Neve. let me ask you a question. Uh, how old are you, Neve? That's not- 20. Okay, 20. right. So when you are 35, what do you want to be doing? Oh my God. Ideal world, you can do Ideal. anything. Um, oh, oh, are they 20? Um, let's think. I would, I mean, I'd love to work at the BBC. Don't ask me what in, because I, I haven't got that far yet. What in? Um, I don't know. See, so my thing is, when I decided not to go to university, every single life plan that I had went completely out the window. So, I mean, I just look at kind of what I'm doing next month rather than thinking what I'm going to be doing in the future. Um, I think I would love to have done lots of different things. Yeah. And I think I would love to... See, there's qualities I'd love to have instead of saying throw on a beat. So I'd love to feel like I have more purpose knowing exactly what I want to do as much as you don't have to I would love to be in a place where I don't get judged anymore for not having a degree and something and I I this hope that when I'm interrupt me this really distresses me who what sort of people are judging you for not having a degree um a lot of people <laughs> when what I what kind of people like I don't mean names but what kind of people who do you mean um people there are people in the industry there are people who I've asked for advice from who are like you need a degree um when I decided not to go to uni I lost a majority of my friends for choosing not to go so I would love one day for yeah. no one to see that as the first thing when they think of me right. so I, I can't give you a face yeah. but that's you why. pitched that story to the BBC no well you should do it's a great story I can't believe it. Literally. What the hell? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and you know, obviously, you know, it's all bullshit. If anyone says, oh, you need a degree, then hopefully. I know. It's, I mean, it's, I don't I, always imagine. know it's bullshit. <laughs> and I don't always feel like it's bullshit, but. Well, you're going to prove them wrong, Neve. So that's the way it is. Thank you. I mean, with that, I think we should wrap it up. I mean, we've had so many questions and I mean, I would have loved to have sat and asked you 46 questions. Um, and I mean, I have even more here. Let, let me look at some of these questions. Let's okay. see, let me pick- You've had some lovely comments as well from people who you've really helped as well. So thank you no. um, for everyone in the comments for being quite open and honest. And thank you so much for being very open and honest as well. Right, let me just look at a couple of questions. I'll just pick pick out okay uh, <laughs> mark crossley he's my cousin <laughs> it can't be the it can't be the same can it um i don't know but he's asked a lot of questions so really? thank you so much oh my god there's so many here I think this is the most questions we've ever had and we've yeah. never asked the pre-submitted ones. Yeah, I have a whole page of them. Really? People have been yeah. very excited about this. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a few on motivation there. Oh, and Mark Crossley, 
if it is my cousin. <laughs> He's asked me, who would I love to interview? I mean, yeah, I think Meghan Markle's a great shout. I'd love to interview Kamala Harris. I'd love to interview Donald mm. Trump. I'd love to interview Rihanna um, because she was in an abusive relationship with Chris Brown. She's never mm. talked about it. Uh, I'd love to interview Nigella Lawson for the same reason. Um, Madonna, I would love to, to do an all-nighter with and then do an interview <laughs> the next morning uh just because she's you know she's an icon um yeah on my instagram i get loads of messages from young women teenagers young women in the 20s talking about motivation and it's partly the lockdown thing and the covid thing mm. but feeling so uncertain about their future i i don't think i've got anything particularly wise to say about it except you know this time is going to pass it's going to be fine you're going to be fine I know it probably feels like this year has been taken away from you, but as we said earlier, oh no, we didn't say earlier, did we? As, as, <laughs> what I should have said earlier was, you know, this time is just going to be a blip in your careers. It's just a blip. You know, imagine you live to 80 and you we kind of had this COVID for a year. That's that's nothing. Um, you've just you've just got to you've just got to have faith in yourself and be persistent and be dogged and don't give up and ask for opportunities and that's I think that, mm, gonna be so, that's going to be so helpful for the people watching a lot of us have spoken to each other. I really hope so yeah mm. I think you know finding that motivation is hard right now yeah. but if you do just think about it as a blip and the your career is going to like blossom and go on I think it's a lovely way to keep like cheerful which is what we all need to be doing now and you've got to work hard you know if you want to get on you've got to work hard it's really competitive you all know that so mm. put in the hours you know and it will come back to you you read what you sow okay well thank you so much for joining us oh, it's, it's been pleasure. amazing to have you on and i know so many people enjoyed it i can see there's some i'm currently looking on twitter my notifications are going off so um, yeah, there's lots of good, people. good luck for your notification <laughs> as well because I'm sure I'll, be I'll be <laughs> thank you so much for asking me thank you for incredible questions and thanks to everybody who's watching and you know contributing I'm really I'm really grateful thank you very very much and good luck thank you